Jacob, uh, where we left off last week on uh, December 2nd, 1522, uh, no, no, 1521, 1521, Luther left the Wartburg secretly on horseback. Following day, he took a noon meal in Leipzig at the tavern of Hans Wagner, who was later interrogated by the authorities on the order of Duke George of Saxony, who was one of these on-again, off-again uh, figures in Luther's life. He was alternately supportive and hostile to him. Uh, Duke George was very pleased by the 95 Theses, was not pleased by Luther's teaching that we're saved by grace alone. And so uh, he sent uh, some of his men to interrogate the tavern owner about Luther's sighting there. Uh, next day, Luther was in Wittenberg and welcomed by his friends and colleagues, including Philip Melanchthon. He'll be important for our story uh, later on. Uh, Nicholas von Amsdorf, another colleague, uh, he'd come with some anxiety to Wittenberg about the status of the Reformation movement there, but what he saw during the few days that he visited, uh, by and large, pleased him. He had heard on his way of aggressive, extreme behavior on the part of those who sided with him, uh, but what he actually found in Wittenberg did not come close to the disastrous reports uh, he had heard. Now, there were signs of the things to come. Uh, while he was there, some Wittenberg students pelted with stones priests from the nearby cloister who were uh, singing the Magnificat in the town church. And uh, we have Luther's comment in one of his letters regarding this, that uh, as unfortunate as it is, uh, one can't keep uh, boys from being boys. <laughs> well, I mean, he's, he's saying in that letter that if that's the worst that's happening, uh, then there's, there's more than enough other things to point to the successful progress of the reforms of the church that had begun with him. What he did see while in Wittenberg uh, that pleased him. Uh, private masses had been replaced with public worship services that included both sermon and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, more monks had left the monastery. One of the more radical preachers had left town. So all this was uh, to, to a, a net positive as far as Luther was concerned. So six days later, Luther's on his way back to the Wartburg, feeling reasonably reassured. Uh, he left with the impression that the Reformation cause was not to be stopped. And he came back to the Wartburg with uh, the conviction that he would stay no longer than Easter. And he would also now take up a great new task, that of translating the Bible into German. In fact, it was his friends back at Wittenberg during that short visit who had strongly encouraged him to do so. And we know this from a letter that Luther himself wrote on December 18th, um, 1521. Uh, this is to a Greek scholar, colleague at Wittenberg, a man named John Lang. And he writes, to my dearest friend John Lang, uh, I do not approve of that tumultuous exodus for the monks could have parted from each other in a peaceful and friendly way. Uh, I think that's, that's a reference to that un unpleasant business that took place. You will be at the next chapter meeting. See to it that you favor and defend the evangelical party. I shall be hiding here until Easter. In the meantime, I shall finish the postal and translate the New Testament into German and undertaking our friend's request. I hear you are also working on this. Continue as you have begun. I wish every town would have its interpreter and that this book alone in all languages would live in the hands, eyes, ears, and hearts of all people. You will hear about other things from the people of Wittenberg. Physically, I'm healthy and well cared for, uh, but I'm also thoroughly buffeted by sins and temptations. Pray for me and farewell. From the wilderness, December 18, 1521. Yours, Martin Luther. Uh, that, by the way, those of you uh, familiar with the Lutheran Bible translators uh, may, may recognize that's their motto. 
uh, the, the line where he says, uh, I wish every town would have its interpreter and this book alone would live in the hands, eyes, ears, and hearts of all people. That's the, the mission statement of Lutheran Bible translators. Um, so I want to back up a, a little bit uh, before we get into how Luther goes about his task of translating the New Testament, which you remember I told you last week took him uh, all of 11 weeks. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to start with uh, a quotation that is fairly typical of, I think, most people's understandings understanding of the Reformation. And once again, I chose the wrong edge uh, for the pages to be double-sided on. This every day, every day that, that I, I always send it the wrong way to the printer. Okay, uh, but uh, either stand on your head or turn the page upside down to read the, the, the first page after the, the cover. This is from Charles Dickens. He expresses it uh, as well as, as anyone else. Luther finding one day to his great surprise that there really was a book called the New Testament which the priests did not allow, not now allow, not allow to be read and which contained truths that they suppressed began to be very vigorous against the whole body from the Pope downward. Um, this is incorrect. Terribly incorrect. And so I, I want to spend some of my time this afternoon or this morning uh, setting the record straight on what exactly is so significant about Luther's New Testament. And it, it is not that for the first time the people have the Bible in their own language. This just isn't true. Okay. So, um, we know uh, very, in, in, uh, to, to a great degree of certainty, just how widely disseminated uh, the Bible had been uh, before uh, Luther came along. Uh, there were at least 20,000 Latin Bible manuscripts in circulation in the 15th century. Those are just the manuscripts, those are just manuscripts, the handwritten things. Uh, not the stuff that Gutenberg's press is churning out. Okay? Uh, the very first book, book to be printed by Gutenberg, not the very first thing to be printed. We all know what the very first thing Gutenberg printed an indulgence. No, it's true. I mean, the very first thing the Gutenberg Press was used to print was an indulgence. But the very first book to be printed was the Mazarin Bible uh, sometime between the years 1452 and 1456. It was a 42-line Bible. You had 42 lines uh, to a page. Uh, before 1520, the number of Latin Bibles published in Germany were... were has to be somewhere between 20,000 and 27,000. The oldest German manuscript of the Bible belongs to the 8th century. It's been preserved. We have one copy, and, and that copy has fragments of Matthew in it. And one of the interesting things about this German manuscript, and this is kind of part of the story, is that this early German manuscript of the Bible, judging by what we have left of it, was very well done. That those it, competent enough to judge such things say it's amazing that such an early translation should have been produced uh, at, at uh, or, or such a good translation should be produced at so early a date. It is much better then later attempts at translating into German. The language is beautiful, at times poetic. In the ninth century, we have not a translation of the whole Bible, but a translation of a gospel harmony. You know what we mean by a gospel harmony? That is where you take the events of Christ's life, death, and resurrection from the, the four gospels and arrange them in a chronological order. And this is a harmony that goes back to the uh, second century Christian Tation. Uh, you have an 11, in the 11th century uh, circulating a translation of the Song of Solomon and two Psalters, two different 
uh, German translations of all of the Psalms. In the 12th century, two more Psalters appear. Uh, in the 13th century, uh, you have four Gospels uh, coming out in German. Um, and now in the 14th century, the 1300s, this is known as the century of the German Bible. Uh, you've got uh, uh, so many uh, German Bibles. It, it's the, the, the first printed Bible uh, belongs to this period. The Wenzel Bible uh, is its it name, and I think I've given you a picture of it. The Wenzel Bible. Um, now, it is perhaps more famous for its illustrations than its text. Um, however, a subsequent edition, uh, like three editions later, uh, the tra some, whoever the translator is undertakes to improve greatly uh, the text. Um, I have a, a biblical historian saying this, uh, here's kind of the problem with uh, the Wenzel Bible as a, as a translation. Even those who attempted to speak good German, with few exceptions, had no idea as to what was required of a good translation. They were satisfied if they were understood. That the German Bible must also be a work of art, that the different words of the originals were to be reproduced, that the German reader should feel what the readers of the original felt, that Cicero had correctly said that the orations of Demosthenes must be produced not as a reader but as a speaker, was a knowledge of which we find only very slight traces in a very few of the translators. Most of them were fearfully prosaic, all on one note, and insufferably tedious. Um, this comes from a, a larger book uh, by a great Lutheran historian by the name of Roy, who says this, finally we're unable to escape the feeling that most of the translators did not really live in Scripture, at least not in its central truth, Christ crucified. Uh, but, that being said, it's, it's by uh, 1520 that we have no fewer than 14 high German printed Bibles circulating and four low German printed Bibles circulating. Um, many consider kind of the first real Bible, the one that was, thanks to Gutenberg, able to be uh, mass-produced, uh, was the so-called Mintel Bible. Did I give you a picture of the Mintel? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the Mintel Bible has a page all its own. Uh, filled with mistaken readings of the Latin, uh, translator often is unable to find the, just the right German word uh, betrays kind of a defective knowledge of the German language. And it's also itself relying on a hundred year old translation and uses phrases that by the time this came out would not have been understood or would have belonged to a dialect uh, most Germans did not share. Uh, nevertheless, it, had, uh, it must have had some value for the common people because it went through three editions. There was demand for this. Um, so, uh, not only from the number of complete Bibles that are circulating, but from the circulation of other theological works that would have contained the contents of Scripture, we can gather that by the time Luther comes along, the the knowledge of the Bible is not nearly as um, a rare a thing as I think most people who tell the story of the Reformation would have it be. Um, for example, if you go back a page, uh, you had maybe even more commonly circulated than complete Bibles, you had these Bible history books. And so th there's a problem with these Bible history books because they don't restrict themselves to the Bible. They, they, they tell a history of God's people based on the historical books of the Old Testament especially, but many of them carry the story into the New Testament. But then they also throw in lives of saints, legendary material, uh, contemporaneous with the events of the Old Testament and things like that. But nevertheless, through those Bible history books, 
children, adults, are getting the contents of the Bible. You have um, very popular as devotional works. You have Psalters in the people's language. You have uh, books that are the accounts of the Passion of Christ in German. You have the so-called Bibles of the Poor, uh, which uh, are less on words, more on, more on illustrations to, to uh, disseminate the contents of the Bible. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you've got all these things that point to the fact that it's just not true the way Dickens put it, that uh, uh, L L Luther is, is one of the, 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 the rare people in Germany actually encountering uh, a, a New Testament. And we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a second. Um, we, we see in later editions... Uh, of, of these Bibles that come out. Uh, one of the most notable of them is this Zaner Bible, which is an improvement upon the Mintel. Uh, and, and all these, these names, by the way, they're the names of the printer. Right? The, the printer gets, gets the credit. Uh, we, we, the, the identity of the translator is lost to us. Uh, and, 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 and which isn't even to say that it's, it's a single translator. You know, maybe, maybe a group, a collaborative effort. Anyway, um, we have a Zaner Bible coming out in 1475, a Swiss Bible, which is, uh, as you would expect, uh, more of the Swiss dialect, but it's, it's based on the Zaner Bible. It comes along in 1477. Um, and, and what we see in these subsequent editions, again, is not so much improvements to the text, to the translating, but we do see something that's very, uh, it's a very interesting part of the story, and that is we see advancements in printing. And we see how quickly printers are catching on as to what their readers want, what they need, and also what helps sell. Uh, any of you, well I, I know you, uh, know the book Brand Luther. There's a, a great book, uh, maybe five years ago, six years ago, came out that um, tells the story of the Reformation primarily in terms of L Luther as entrepreneur or Luther as uh, marketer and, and how this is a bit of an exaggeration and I, I think the author is, is careful not to put it exactly this way but Luther invents the title page. That's not quite true the, but the, the hundred years between Gutenberg and Luther, that's coming around. Uh, we're we're going to see the title page of his first New Testament just says, German New Testament, Wittenberg. The name of the book, where it was printed. But that's the last time you'll see it that way. right? Going forward, you see the kinds of things that we expect a book's title page to have. Um, this is one of the things that the, the printers learn really early on with Luther himself. He is the best-selling author in Europe and will be his whole life and will probably continue to be a, a generation after he dies. Uh, they, they can't print his stuff fast enough. And so it pays to have in big capital letters Martin Luther on the, the front of the book. So as people go to the booksellers, they know, aha, this is a Martin Luther work. Uh, we, we kind of take these things for granted, but, but that's being developed in the time leading up to Luther's translation of, of, of the New Testament. And, and, and we see it in these, these later editions of the Bibles. The, the title page evolves. Okay, uh, what else? N n another, um, another book uh, commonly uh, circulated and in the possession of, of many ordinary people a book called the Planaria. So these Planaria uh, would, would contain all the readings that you would hear in church on a given Sunday, plus all the readings appointed for any special day in the church, a saint's day, for example, and there are all kinds of extra uh, weekdays. So, so all the weekdays of the Christmas season would have appointed readings. The the, the, the first week after Easter would have appointed readings for each of those days. And so when you take those, those books into account, 
Uh, you easily have all the content of the Gospels spread across the pages of these books, uh, as well as much of the, the Psalter and, and, and the rest of the Bible. So uh, again, you know, part of the picture, you know, we're, we're getting to the question of, okay, if this be the case, what is so special about Luther's New Testament? <laughs> right? uh, it's not that this is the first time the Bible's being put uh, in German. Um, so, a uh, terrible mistake uh, to imagine that at the close of the Middle Ages, um, that uh, people are as unenlightened or <laughs> ignorant of the Bible as they are so often pictured by us. Um, so, he, here, here's the, 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 the quote that, that uh, throws a wrench in the works, and that is, Luther himself will say, the Bible was unknown under the papacy. But what does he really mean by that? He does not mean that the actual Bible was not, ex or, or that people weren't exposed to the actual Bible, but that other things stood in the way of hearing the Bible speak for itself. That's what he's getting at when he says the Bible was unknown under the papacy. Uh, so one historian, a guy named uh, Peach, says this, the Bible was not properly valued for the consciousness of its significance and its superiority to all other theological literature. It wasn't recognized and valued as the primary source of Christianity and the sole foundation of the church, but was smothered in the mass of surrounding theological writing, and its understanding was conditioned by the interpretation of the church. As Luther himself will put it, under the papacy, scripture was despised. Uh, so it's widely disseminated, and yet we have these things standing in the way of the pure, clear words of, of, of the Bible actually reaching the people. And we see part of this in... Uh, the, the, the evolution of the attitude on the part of the hierarchy of the church toward the Bible and the vernacular over time. In the days of Charlemagne, we all know Charlemagne, okay, uh, emperor in 800, AD 800, uh, Charlemagne becomes this great unifying figure for the Western, uh, you know, Western Christendom uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire. Charlemagne greatly encourages the translation of the, of the Bible into people's languages. There were some in the church in his day who said there are only three holy languages, and those are the languages that Pilate wrote the inscription on the cross with. So Aramaic, Greek, Latin, nothing else. And, and Charlemagne said that's ridiculous. And so you, we, we, we heard already how we already have German Bibles in the 8th century, in the 9th century, in the 10th century, and so forth. Charlemagne encouraged that. But over time, we have, for example, Gregory VII living in the 11th century, uh, prohibiting the Slavs from conducting the liturgy in their own language. He said, because scripture is obscure in many places. So we can only trust the Latin. <laughs> Innocent III, in the 12th century, issued a papal de decree saying that Jesus' words, it has been given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. It's been given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Remember this? Jesus telling his disciples that, that the, the, the parables are going to be lost on the outsiders, but you yourselves are, 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 are given to know. Well, that only applies to the teaching hierarchy of the church. <laughs> That, that was the Pope's decree. And that decree actually becomes incorporated into canon law. So by the time Luther comes along, that's, that's a statement that, that no one can teach the scriptures, but those authorized by, by the Pope or the bishops. Gregory XI in 1376 declared all knowledge of the Bible to be placed under ecclesiastical control. And in 1300, the Emperor Charles V prohibited all books written in German that dealt with Holy Scripture. 
you have Wycliffe's translation. Wycliffe comes uh, about 100 years before Luther. He's a contemporary of John Huss. Wycliffe's translation is condemned by the Council of Oxford. And in 1485, this is more of a regional thing, but Archbishop of Mainz, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, Luther's going to have run-ins with this guy's successor. Um, he condemned all translations of the Bible. So, it wasn't a prohibition of the Bible itself, but he was very concerned about it being translated into German. Uh, and he, he was convinced that the German language wasn't able to reproduce the profound ideas of, of, of the Greek or uh, of, of Latin authors and so forth. Um, so by the time we get to Luther, we've gone from Charlemagne and encouraging translation of the Bible to a period in which it's tolerated to a point where not everywhere, but in some places, and some places very close to where Luther is, it's actually censored. Um, from 1491 until 1518, and see, this, this reflects that change in attitude. You have only two complete printed Bibles appear. And we had a flourishing in the 14th century, see. But, uh, but by the time you get nearer Luther's uh, life, uh, only two new translations show up, and the printer of one of them spends a whole lot of his preface apologizing. <laughs> um, so, what prevented the Bible from becoming a book of the people? I know, again, the conventional story is lack of literacy. And that's hard to support, given, first of all, the success of these Bibles. Uh, you, you know, you, you've got a Bible that goes through three editions pretty quickly. That's not because the, uh, you know, the, 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 the apostle's uh, handler is, is buying all the books in bulk and, 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 and storing them in a warehouse so they can show up top of the New York Times bestseller list. That's what our politicians do. Um, you know who's going to, you know who actually owns, you know the, the memoirs of Ted Cruz or whatever. Uh, and, and yet, uh, amazingly, it, it's it's top of the list. That, that kind of thing. Uh, that that kind of thing didn't go on. The printers are printing it because people are buying it. Um, moreover, Luther's own New Testament, when it hits the market. Uh, Within uh, three months, the printers can't satisfy demand. How is this happening if we've got a bunch of illiterate people out there? Moreover, uh, or, or the, the other argument is that the Bible um, couldn't, uh, wasn't the book of the people because it was so expensive to own. And that may have that was certainly true at the very beginning of the days of the Gutenberg press, but it is certainly not true by the time you get to Martin Luther. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the price of his New Testament, for example, uh, when we get there. But we have inventories of people's estates who lived around the time of Martin Luther, or lived after Martin Luther, and in you know, the vast majority of them, we're talking 75% of the inventories of a, of a certain large town, have among the books in the library a complete Bible. So, again, the, the affordability argument doesn't hold up either. Um, so what's going on? Well, what stands in the way of the Bible being a book of the people is that first of all, all translations up to this point were based strictly on the Latin Vulgate that Jerome had produced back in the, the late uh, 300s, late 4th century, early, or early, uh, early 5th century. And, and see, that, that's also an interesting story. Uh, let's not knock the Latin Vulgate. Uh, L L Luther um, has much more to say admiringly of the Vulgate than he does critically. Uh, he does discover errors, mistakes in the translation from the Hebrew and the Greek, and, and he's astonished by these mistakes, partly because 
he didn't have an original source to compare them to. But that's only starting to happen in Luther's era, where you have a return to the sources. You have this movement called humanism, which isn't humanism in the sense that we use that term, but it was a method, it was a, a, an approach to learning and, and reading that was replacing the old, dried out, scholastic method of you take a proposition, you consider all the things in favor of it, you consider all the things against it, and then, then, then you, you rebut the things against it so as to affirm the things for it, that kind of thing. You know, Thomas Aquinas, right? Everything he does is in this scholastic mode of thinking. Well, all of a sudden you, you have this um, rediscovery of ancient texts, the writings of Cicero, for example, or the writings of some of the greatest Greek writers. And these humanists are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've been depending all these years on a translation into Latin of what was originally written in Hebrew and Greek. Let's go back to the source documents because the Latin translation could be wrong in places. And one of the, 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 the biggest leaders of this humanist, humanist movement is Erasmus of Rotterdam. And he publishes in 1516, I believe, a complete Greek New Testament. He goes back to the, the sources available to them at the time and makes available, especially to scholars, the New Testament in the original Greek. Along with that, he has his own translation of the Latin, so he's not depending on Jerome anymore, it's his own, and he has various annotations. Uh, footnotes that say, aha, here it reads this way. It's very possible there, there's a, a, a letter uh, mis, miscopied or something, or, or, or the sense of this uh, is best rendered with this Latin, those kinds of things. That's his Greek New Testament, which comes out in 1516. And guess who gets his hands on it the day it comes out? Martin Luther. Loves this thing. And then there's a, a second edition in 1517 that Luther then gets as well. Um, so that's... Um, uh, the, 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 the Vulgate, nevertheless, when it was done, was a, an amazing work of translation and did in, in many ways help unify the churches because now you had a common reading of Scripture. But it's also a, a, a very true-to-life story in that, and I think we can all relate to this, as the Latin Vulgate spreads to, to other parts of church, it's, it, it, it takes a while, it takes more than a generation to reach the point where it becomes the Bible of the church. And even then, you have, let's say, in England, they're still going to know their Psalms, for example, according to some English translation. I, I think that the, the, the comparison for us would be no, no matter how many translations of the Bible come out, we will always pray the Lord's Prayer according to the King James. Yep. You see? Or, or, or the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm can only be in the King James. I'm exaggerating a little, but, but you see, it, it's hard to overcome those kinds of uh, especially with language that's poetic. Uh, and, 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 it, and because it's poetic, it's memorable and it sticks with you. And so, okay, Jerome, that's nice and all, but I'm, I'm doing it this way. And, 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 and this way may have even been a Latin way, but it's not Jerome's Latin way. And again, that having the Bible in Latin was great when everybody spoke Latin. But that obviously doesn't remain the case, especially after the, the barbarians take over. Uh, it, it's, it's certainly not the case by the time of Charlemagne and so forth, so that Latin becomes the, the language of the educated, but everybody else is speaking their, their, their romance language, whatever it is. So uh, there's great need to hear the, the Bible, to read the Bible in the language your mother taught you. That, 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 that emerges. Um, and, and that just wasn't happening with all these other translations, because these other translations were both bound to the Vulgate, not the original texts, and 
and as we heard, dependent on church approval. <laughs> and so there were many things you just could not do with your translation if it ran afoul of what the church felt was the official way to say that. Um, in, in one of the things that gets Erasmus in hot water is he sees right away that the church all this time is mistranslating repent. So repent in the Greek is simply a, a, a change in direction, a changing of the mind, a, a turning a different way. But everywhere in Jerome's Vulgate, it's translated, do penance. You see? Hear the difference? So, so no German translation between Charlemagne and Luther is going to be able to get away with saying repent in German instead of do penance. Okay? Another thing that stood in the way of the Bible becoming a book of the people is the, well, this, this gets reflected in, in Luther's own training. You know, this is very typical of a teacher of the church, Luther's own course of studies. Luther at university studied primarily philosophy. And philosophy meant primarily studying Aristotle. Then you went off to seminary and at seminary, you would have done so many lectures on the Bible. But then the culmination of your seminary course was studying one of these scholastic theologians, a guy by the name of Peter Lombard. And you studied his you know, something like seven volume <laughs> sentences. And Peter Lombard's sentences were a series of um, statements uh, God is one in, you know, one essence in, in three persons. Here's all the things that support that. Here are all the things that, that uh, deny that. Here are why those, those uh, denials are wrong. And, and hundreds, literally thousands of these that you have to become expert on before you can graduate from seminary and, and be ordained. So notice the Bible's part of the curriculum but it's smothered in <coughs> philosophy and scholastic theology. So anything that the Bible has to say on its own is filtered through the lens of Aristotle and this one chief teacher of the church, Peter Lombard. And so that's why you'll see in Luther's letters leading up to the publication of the New Testament, what's he interested in? He wants people to encounter the scriptures as he finally did, unadorned, unassisted, just the pure word of God, saying what God wants it to say. That, that stood in the way. And then finally, the approach, again taught by Peter Lombard, is the so-called fourfold sense of scripture. Have we heard of this before? Which is to say, when you interpret Scripture, there are four meanings that you are to get out of any one passage. First is the literal. What it actually says. Whole hum. Who cares what it says? There's more important things than what it actually means. The second is the allegorical. The third is the moral, and this is a big word, I'll explain, the anagogical. So that is to say, every text means four things at the same time. The literal meaning was pretty much restricted to a record of the past event. The text says this happened, it happened, that's your literal meaning. The allegorical is somehow to see what you just read as symbolic of some truth that applies usually to the church in general. You know, how does, how does uh, the, the, the inn that uh, the uh, good Samaritan leaves the man half dead uh, for safekeeping in, what does the inn represent? Ah, oh, it represents the church. 
The church is to be that place that cares uh, for, 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 those, uh, for those hurt and so forth. The moral is taking the, the passage and seeing what it's saying to you as an individual Christian as to what you're supposed to do. And then finally the anagogical, that has to do with how it points to future life in heaven. In, in what way does the Good Samaritan, for example, uh, point ahead to, to life at last in the kingdom to come? So, so every passage of Scripture is read through this, this, this fourfold lens. And, and Luther, I mean, some of the best Luther scholars would argue the heart of the Reformation lies in Luther rejecting this approach to the Bible. And what does Luther want to put in its place? Simple meaning. I just want to know what the Bible says. And so he has this grammatical, exegetical approach that's interested in what does the author inspired by the Holy Spirit want me to know. And there should be one meaning. Not two, not three, not four. As he says in, in, in a letter around this time, how can, uh, how, how can we have assurance for our salvation? based as it is on Scripture, when Scripture has manifold meaning. See? So the simple, the simple um, meaning of, of the text. Um, now, I alluded earlier to Luther's first encounter with a complete Bible. It, it's safe to say that, that Luther from his elementary school days on was steeped in Scripture. Now, how? Not by way of reading a printed Bible necessarily, but because he's going to church all the time, he's in church schools in which you have uh, uh, a chapel every day, you, you have readings from Scripture every day. You're praying psalms every day. Um, and, and that's going on every day for all the formative years of Luther's life. So L Luther is uh, certainly exposed to a lot of Scripture by the time he enters university and certainly by the time he enters the monastery. But there is the story, and there's much debate about it, um, just a, a little in the weeds with, with Luther's historiography. We, we, we know uh, of his so-called table talk. You know, there's a whole volume of the American edition of Luther's works called his table talk, or in the German, the Tischreden, uh, what, what he spoke at table. And, and, and what it is, is, as you can kind of gather, is his students gathering around uh, Luther's dining table, uh, drinking beer af after the meal, and, and Luther just holding forth on this, that, and everything. The, the, the problem, though, is how reliable are the table talk? Because they're, they're not published, they're not vetted by Luther himself. They're just accounts by the students who knows how long afterwards. And uh, there are Luther scholars that when, they, when it comes to the table talk, They'll, they'll say, okay, you, you, let's say you've got four students primarily responsible for these collections of Luther's sayings around the table. And, and they'll say, you know, of the four, this is the, this is the guy you can trust the most, right? <laughs> Anything this guy says, forget it, right? <laughs> that, that, that kind of thing. And uh, so you, you have different accounts that, that, that conflict in certain ways when Luther talks about when he read the saw a complete Bible for the first time. And it has to do with when it actually happened. And so, depending on which of these sources of his table talk you're reading, it could have happened as late as the monastery, or it could have happened as early as the equivalent of his high school years. And the, the table talk recorder that people say is, is the most reliable, it makes sense to read what he's saying as saying that Luther did it He's recounting an episode that took place when he was about 15 or 16. Uh, but, what about that encounter with the complete Bible, which, which was kept in the library of the school? Um, 
First, he was astonished at how big it was. <laughs> and then he starts to read it. And one of the first things he reads is the account of Samuel and Hannah. And, and, and he had never heard it before. Isn't that something? And, 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 and you know, he, he can't stop reading. And, and he, you know, reads on and, and reads pretty much all of the Samuel material out of 1 Samuel. Uh, and that's very interesting, isn't it? Um, and that's probably one of the most critical turning points for Luther in his attitude towards Scripture, second only to his father confessor, the, the abbot, as it were, of the monastery where he was a monk tasking him with becoming a lecturer on the Bible. Because I, I think we can all relate to this. You, you never know something as well as when you're forced to teach it. <laughs> and, and so beginning uh, roughly 1512, I've got the dates here. These are kind of significant. Uh, let's see, I've got the stuff in my handwriting. I've got the stuff I typed up. I think it's a handwriting thing. Mm. But, but, but I, I want to give you a sequence of what he teaches. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So, beginning in 1513, all the way to 1515, when he's been uh, assigned, uh, made a teacher of the church. And, and, and by the way, what's his PhD in? Old Testament. Old Testament. So, Luther's Hebrew is actually better than his Greek. And, 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 and probably is still that way at the time of his translating the, the, the New Testament. I've got a, a, a charming little anecdote in a second. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing he decides to lecture on are the Psalms. 1513 to 1515. Then he takes up the book of Romans. 1515 to 1516. Uh, then I think it's, it's Hebrews for a time, then 1516 to 1517, Galatians, and then he comes back to the Psalms, 1518 to 1521. Later in his life, you've heard me read from it uh, many a time, tell the story, Luther has a preface to the publication of his German writings, right? Um, so this is in the 1540s, gives an account of his discovering the gospel. And he tells us that it happened in the course of his preparing lectures on the Psalms. And what had been bothering him to no end was how to understand when Paul talks about the gospel being the righteousness of God in Romans chapter 1. Because again, through the, the fourfold sense of Scripture, through the teaching authority of the church, righteousness of God meant one thing. It meant the active righteousness of God by which he judges us for failing to live up to it. And so here's Luther saying, how can it be good news <laughs> that God is righteous in this sense? And he just keeps knocking on Paul's door, demanding that the Holy Spirit open this up to him. And so as he keeps reading Romans over and over again, it finally hits him, especially when you get to Romans 3, we, we uh, hold that one is justified by faith alone. Or, or even the, the next verse in Romans 1, which quotes from Habakkuk, the, the business of the righteous shall live by faith. And then he discovers, ah, this is an entirely different kind of righteousness. This is a righteousness that God imputes to us, that he credits us with, that now can avail before God. It's not my own, I simply receive it as a gift. And that's exactly Paul's argument in the rest of Romans. And this opens up, he calls it the key to scripture. It opens up his teaching on the Psalms and he sees this righteousness of God understood in just that way show up everywhere in the Psalms of David and so forth. Uh, so that's a very big deal. And see that experience with the scriptures of letting the scriptures interpret themselves, of letting God speak for himself is what's motivating him now to put the scriptures in the language of his people so that they can have that same experience. Forget the fourfold approach to the scriptures. Forget what the Pope says. Uh, forget Jerome's Vulgate. Here's what the Bible itself says. Let, let it speak to you as it has spoken to me. 
uh, so that you may share in the joy and the peace that the Bible uh, ha has, has given me. And uh, So, th those two things, uh, early on uh, discovering a, a complete Bible, but then later on being made a teacher of that Bible and having to wrestle with what the thing actually says, uh, it's... it's um, a marvelous thing to we we have Luther's Bible that he used to teach the Psalms from, and so what he would do is he would lay out the Psalm verses in such a way that there was a lot of space between the verses for him to write notes in, and, and I mean it's just filled with ink these pages of of all the notes and the connections that that Luther is making. Uh, as he writes in the psalm, and you see him over time sort of make connections to this gospel discovery, and he's applying them to the psalm. So, uh, you know, so, some like to say, he's got it by Psalm 8. No, 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 he doesn't have it until Psalm 16. You know, that, that kind of thing. That, that's what, yeah, that's what scholars get paid to do, right? Uh, act in the life. So, um, I, I, I bring all that up to say, here's part of what makes... Luther's New Testament so distinctive and why it's not an understatement to, to regard Luther as the master translator of the Bible. And next time we're together, we will uh, talk about the impact, the legacy of his Bible and, and might dip into you know, some of these wonderful linguistic uh, choices that, that, that Luther makes and his own defense of them. I wanted to get into some of that now, but I think I'm not going to make it. Um, but, but, but two of the things that Luther brings to the task of translating the Bible into German that no prior German translator did was, first of all, his uh, incredible, almost miraculous familiarity with Scripture. That by the time he's done those lectures on Psalms and Romans and Psalms again, um, friends and foes of Luther alike are constantly amazed at how well he knows the Bible. That you go to an Augustine, <laughs> uh, you know, who's uh, uh, not, not small potatoes, <laughs> but, 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 but Luther surpasses Augustine in, in the number of connections and, and, and knowledge of the, the entirety of the Bible. As, as revealed in these lectures and then later the polemical writings and so forth. And so he brings that to, to the task of translating it. That, that he gets a sense of the, the whole. And so that sense of the whole, and especially that understanding that, that Christ is the center of the scriptures, is going to govern every decision he makes. Every decision. He'll, he'll say at one point that I would rather, with Augustine, uh, make a few errors in the text... And, and get justification by grace alone right, then get the text right with the Jews and miss Jesus altogether. You see? Because Jesus himself says, right? They, the scriptures in which you search for eternal life bear witness about me, John 5.39. Or him in the road to Emmaus and taking those disciples through Moses and the prophets and how they all bear witness to him. Uh, opened up the scriptures to them. And so his translation is going to do that. He, he, he's going to make sure his translation doesn't stand in the way of the reader, or the hearer, uh, getting that. Uh, when Melanchthon, Melanchthon is the greatest Greek scholar of the century in which he lived. Luther gets Melanchthon on the faculty at Wittenberg. And when Melanchthon comes along, he decides right off the bat, he's going to make sure everybody's up to snuff in their Greek. And so he teaches a course on Homer. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And we know Luther, we know the day that Luther went out and bought Iliad and the Odyssey in the Greek. And he's now sitting in Melanchthon's class. And his enthusiasm is so great that Melanchthon commends him as an example to the other students. <laughs> if only you would take to this the way Luther is, right? And so that... Um, it's going to inform you know, that, that experience. Again, his, his Greek's not the best, uh, but it's, it's, it's good enough. And so in those 11 weeks, he's applying what he's learned that way 
to translating the New Testament, as well as he's got the Vulgate. He's looking at that too. He's looking at the Latin. Uh, but again, part of the enterprise that's so, so amazing is that you, there, there are times when you can say, oh yeah, he's definitely depending on Erasmus here. He's definitely depending on Jerome here. But more often than not, he's his own man. And he's free from both in, in, in his choices uh, for translation. When, when he leaves the Wartburg in March and returns to Wittenberg, first thing he does is he meets up with Melanchthon and says, we, 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 we gotta, I, I got some, some blanks to fill in. Help me. Okay, and he, gets, he forms, a, I think he uses the word, he forms a kind of Sanhedrin of scholars that he consults with. And, and it's fun to read about this. Melanchthon gets obsessed with numismatics, coins. And so he's going around. He asks the, the court secretary to Frederick, uh, I, I need the names of these coins and describe them to me, Right? Uh, because we, we want, oh, jewels, jewels to describe the roads, the streets of heaven from Revelation. That's also a big deal. So, so we, we, we need a description of, of these jewels, what colors are they, and so forth. Uh, but, but, but the coin matter is very important to Melanchthon. He wants to know the value of the coin so we can translate the denarius in terms of golden or sh- you know, what, what, what have you. And, and, and you have Luke Melanchthon in a letter saying, I can't believe no one took this seriously before. Right? <laughs> and and uh, they, they reach out to get an ancient map of Palestine. And that doesn't happen. That, that, that never comes to fruition in time for the publication. That was going to be part of the, 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 the published New Testament. It would include that. Um, so so, so they're, they're hard at work. And by September, by September, it's ready to go. And we think more or less September 25th, September 23rd, it, it comes off the press. And that's why it's known to this day as the September Testament. The, the, the New Testament that, that, that Luther published first was called the September Testament. And it's int- the contents include um, not just a translation of the Bible, but things we're used to finding in our Bibles. And they didn't start with Luther. Um, he has prefaces pretty much to all the books of the Bible, which Jerome's Vulgate also did. He had written a piece just before this, what to look for and expect in the Gospels. And so his preface to the Gospels includes much of that material that he had previously written. But you know, one of the things he says, there aren't four Gospels, there's only one. There's only one. And what is it? It's the glad tidings that, that Jesus Christ has died and risen for us sinners and that all that he's won for us is appropriated by faith. Um, so he, he, he talks about how to read the Bible, how to look for Christ in every verse and so forth. And, and then maybe the, the, of all the prefaces, the, the, the one that, that everyone singles out is the preface to Romans, by which, among others, John Wesley was converted. Right, a reading of, of, of Luther's preface to Romans. And, and, and you see no greater contrast in what had come before him um, than comparing his preface to Romans with Jerome's. See? So, so, so Luther, in, in, in all these ways, is helping the, the, the average German um, encounter the Christ of Scripture that had been veiled, shut up, through all these legalistic techniques where, where the, the main sense of every passage of Scripture always comes out moral always comes out legal, what you have to do. Last thing to say. So besides bringing that incredible familiarity with Scripture to the task of translation, what else does Luther bring? His expertise in the German language. There are... <laughs> uh, there, so some have undertaken to e- estimate how traveled Luther was during his life. And for the times, he was very well traveled. So that the estimate is somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 2,000 miles that he covered in his lifetime on horse or on foot. Now, through all that traveling, what happened? Luther interacted with a lot of different people 
a lot of people that spoke different forms of German. In Luther's day, you basically had three different German language groups, the high, the middle, the low. And within each of those, there were sub-dialects. It was hardly a, a unified language. Uh, what was emerging around the time of Luther, mainly because of communications among different princedoms, different territories, where you had to have a kind of standardization of spelling. You, you had to be able to understand each other as one court uh, communicated with another court. And so that's helping move the language to something that you know, a German up here and a German down here can both understand. But Luther will say around this time that it was to the point that a German living 30 miles from another couldn't understand each other. Um, so, so Luther and his keen ear through all these interactions with different Germans is, is learning how to speak the people's way. And, and that's what he brings to, uh, to, to, to the translation. And we can speak more to that next time. I just want to show you Sarah Booker, who had to leave. She asked last week, did he make mistakes? Did he ever have to cross stuff out? <laughs> well, on the last page, uh, this is not from the New Testament. This is going to be the, the, the later work on the Old Testament. Um, but you see on the right, this is Luther's own hand. Okay, this is the printer's transcription of what's on the right. But one of the things that's so fun to, to watch happen, the New Testament goes through 20 plus editions over the course of Luther's life. The complete Bible, which won't come out till 1534, it's going to go through another seven or eight editions. Uh, in the German collection of the, the Weimar is, is, is the name of the, the collection of all of Luther's writings, which numbers some hundred folio-sized volumes, uh, only about 60% of which, a little more than that by now, has been translated into English. But in one of those volumes, what they do is they put side by side the 1522 New Testament and the 1546. And so you see how many changes Luther makes. He never tires of improving, of getting just the right word. And you'll see in his handwriting that he'll go along and for a particular uh, Greek verb, he'll, he'll just write, six German synonyms. Okay? And then you see him mark out all but one. Yeah. You know, he's weighing each word. And, and scholars will say, it, it is, it, it's so fun to go through and, and consider the choices that he could have made. And just about every time you say, yeah, you were right, Luther. You, you went with the best one of the six. That, that kind of thing. I mean, it's just amazing. He talks, he, he describes the process as, uh, he has a pitcher of Greek that he's going to pour into his pitcher of German. And sometimes he has to pour back and pour again, sometimes as many as four times before it, it balances. Right? Um, we'll, we'll talk about his defense of the more controversial choices he made, uh, the most controversial of which being the by faith alone, the, the supposed addition of a word that isn't there, and how dare you, and so forth. Uh, but, but, but that defense, which comes in 1530, so a good seven years after the New Testament is published, but, but he writes this defense of his translation uh, that's, that tells us a lot about how he went about it, but then it's fun to read the defense of uh, things like that, you know, why, why faith alone, uh, not just leave it at faith, and uh, uh, Mary's greeting, or, or the, the, Gabriel's greeting of Mary, and, and things like that. Uh, it's, it, it's very good. So, anyway, uh, don't know that we have much time for questions. I'll make a point to keep next week's under an hour so that there is time. But but I any questions or, or comments I, about? I've got yeah, right. Uh, when we talk about Luther uh, uh, doing this in a way that people can read it for themselves rather than filter. Yeah. But yet he has the uh, the, the prefaces. So That's right. And, and, and we have Bibles today uh, that we and, and then we look at with a whole bunch of notes right before before yeah. and after. And then when we put people through confirmation class, we don't 
give them a Bible and tell them to go sit in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's right. So, I mean, there, that's there, right. There, there is direction, is my point. Right? Yeah, there's, for sure. Right. For sure. And, and see, we, we never read in a vacuum. Yeah. So we, we, we come to the Bible with all kinds of preconceptions. Right. And so much of what Luther does, and, and there are notes as well. It's like a study Bible. Sort of he has thing. annotations, but, but he knows what the people have been taught wrongly uh, yeah. up to this point. And so right. he's going to say, forget that. That's not what it says. Right. See for yourself. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so, I mean, that's part of it that when... His a translation approach, for example, is what we would call in today's translational terms a dynamic equivalency. Uh-huh. He wants the sense more than necessarily a literal uh-huh. word for word yeah. because he gets that a Greek idiom doesn't work literally the same way in German. You've got you've to realize, okay, this is an idiom that gets at this idea. Oh, here's how we would say it in German. Uh-huh. Here's the equivalent proverb in German that expresses that. Yeah. And then you compare the two, you know, these are, these are completely different words. Ah, but the sense is the same, right? So his, so his translation is better in, 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 a, in a sense because he knows the whole Bible rather yeah. than just the language. Right, right, okay. right, yeah. right. right. I'll, 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 I'll give you, a, let's see, here's a fun example. So he gets criticized there's, there's a place in, in Jonah. This, this is a, uh, the whole Bible translation later. Jo- Jonah obviously isn't part of the New Testament. But there, there's a passage in Jonah where Jonah says, um, uh, I, I, I will not see uh, the holy temple. I will, I will never again see the holy temple. Okay? And um, critics say, not isn't in the Hebrew. Okay? It says, I will see the holy temple. And, and Luther says, trust me, he said not. Because <laughs> uh, I've been with Jonah in that fish. You haven't. Okay? Now, you say, okay, he's adding to scripture there. But then he goes on to say, and this is actually the exegetical argument, is that those words could be, be understood as a question, anticipating a negative answer. And, and, and there, there he's got them, yeah. right? That, that, that the Hebrew could go either way. You don't have, punctu- you don't have a question mark right. on, the, on the old Hebrew typewriters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so he's got both a fun way of defending it and a more technical way of defending it. The technical being that, yeah, those, those words as arranged set up for a question that could be anticipating a negative, that, that if, if it is a question... Hebrew has a way of, of signaling whether it expects the answer to be no or yes. And in this particular case, the answer would be no, in which case, that is what Jonah's saying. He doesn't expect to see the Holy Temple again. He's stuck in the belly of a fish. Yeah, so, so that kind of thing. In, in, the, in the Greek, you know, that's one way of um, uh, understanding Jesus with Thomas. You know, that, that those words in Greek could just as easily be Jesus saying... Um, do you believe because you see? Mm-hmm. Right? Or, they could be translated as a statement, you believe because you saw. Mm-hmm. Blessed are those who, who don't see and believe. Right? But, but it, it could go either way. We, we, it, uh, anyway, all right. So, but but, but that, that gives you kind of, Luther, he's, like, like Roy said, right? That all these previous translators, they didn't live in the Bible the way Luther did. I mean, J- Jonah's in the room with him. Right, the, the, the apostles are, are his best friends. He, he's, he's, you know, he, he gets upset with sermons that say John the Baptist doubted. You know, no, no, he's doing it for his, his, his disciples. He knows that Jesus is the one, right? But, but, but you're attacking a friend of his. You know, Luther and John the Baptist go way back. So, but, but that's the spirit he brings to the work of translating the Bible, and no wonder it endures to this day. It shapes the German language. The most recent revision of the German Bible was about 50 years ago. It is still substantially Luther's Bible, 500 years later. Isn't that something? And we're going to find out next week that we've been probably reading Luther's Bible all this time, 
because of its great impact on the King James. That there's a, a direct line to the King James from, from, from Luther. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad you're here. We'll do this one more time next week.